John DeCarmine serves as the operations director for the Grace Marketplace and the North Central Florida Coalition for the Homeless and Hungry. He began working on homeless assistance projects as a volunteer with an organization called Food Not Bombs in 1996, and he has been a part of the advocacy community ever since. In 2002, he signed on as the first employee of the Alachua County Coalition for the Homeless and Hungry. He has been a part of the movement toward a one-stop homeless services campus since 2004. In 2005, he co-authored Project Grace, which featured Grace Marketplace as a key component of the community's 10-year plan to end homelessness. He was named executive director of the Gainesville Alachua County Office on Homelessness shortly after adoption of the plan. DeCarmine received a master's degree in family, youth, and community sciences from the University of Florida in 2013. Welcome, John. Thanks, Mark. So it's, it's been a very long road. Um, I've been aware of your efforts and the efforts of others in the, uh, addressing the homelessness challenges that we have as a community for well over a decade now. And I know you've been involved in it longer than that. but. Uh, can you take us back to maybe your first involvement in homelessness issues and then kind of move forward a little bit with the various fits and starts that have happened in the community leading up to the facility we have now? Sure. I originally got involved working with homeless folks back in 1996 with a group called Food Not Bombs, and we used to prepare food in the St. Francis House kitchen. We'd bring it across the street to Lynch Park back before it was a dog park. and just share food with people out there. And there'd be between 20 and 60 people on, on most days. And from what I remember, most of the services that were available to people who were out on the street, not necessarily shelter residents, were in the downtown area. And it's right. St. Francis House and the Salvation Army primarily. The Homeless Coalition, which is an umbrella organization of about 40 different agencies that provide services to people without housing, has a number of different agencies that provide shelter outside of the downtown area. There's primarily women, children, some veterans, domestic violence victims, but the agencies that were serving kind of people on the street were, were St. Francis and the Salvation Army. Right. And so early on, uh, I had gone to work with the Homeless Coalition after I graduated from college, so it was 2002. I was the first employee the coalition ever had, and the agency functioned as pretty much a, an agency that passed through federal funds. We wrote grants, we coordinated services, tried to make sure that we were doing what we were doing as effectively as possible. But nobody really understood how big the problem was or how small the problem was. Uh, people had best estimates about how many people were out on the street, about why they were homeless, about what caused their homelessness and what they needed to get off of the street. So starting in 2002, the coalition started doing what we call point in time counts. And that's quite a, uh, an effort. Oh, you, you folks literally go out to where the homeless people are and try mm -hmm. to find out at any given moment how many homeless there are? Right, and we do it in, in one 24-hour period, so we eliminate as much as possible any duplication of people. And the first year that we did that, I think we found around 800 people, and that includes people who were on the street, people who were in shelters, people who were living in the woods surrounding Gainesville and surrounding the downtown area, and then homeless school children as well. And that effort, I think more than anything, has sort of helped us get a handle on what we're trying to address. You know, without knowing what the problem was, we couldn't really begin to start solving it. What was the number on the latest? It was just time? over 2,000. So right? it's more than doubled since 2002. Right. And, and the shape and the composition of the population has changed a lot too. Whereas it used to be more kind of your stereotypical homeless person, somebody you'd expect to see on the street. Today, the, the face of homelessness is really a lot more likely to be uh, a minimum wage earner, a member of a family with children, a young veteran, people with mental illness, people with substance abuse issues, certainly, but domestic violence victims. And there, there's nothing stereotypical about what the face of homelessness looks like today. And when did you first get involved in the idea of finding a facility somewhere in Gainesville or Alachua County for a, a homeless uh, 
shelter? Way back in 2004. I think the idea first came up on a committee that uh, former Mayor Pegin Hanrahan had put together at some transitional committees and uh, the social services committee started talking about the fact that we were asking people who have limited to no access to transportation to travel all around town to get the help that they need. That somebody would have to go to one agency to get help with one service and then they'd have to both get a bus pass or, or find a bicycle and then travel four miles in another direction to get access to another service. So we started talking about how much easier it would be for people to transition out of homelessness if they could access all of the services that they needed in one place. So John, you, you mentioned Mayor Hanrahan, and this was around the same time that she and County Commissioner Rodney Long were uh, putting together the 10-year the plan to end homelessness. Can right. you tell us a little bit about that effort? Sure. You know, if, if nothing else came out of the 10-year plan to end homelessness, the fact that we are now moving forward with Grace Marketplace, which was a centerpiece of that plan. Uh, that element of it, and also I think the thing the 10-year plan highlighted most was that we have hundreds and hundreds of people in this community who are willing to use their time and their resources to invest in ending homelessness. You know, that's something that we hadn't really seen before. Mm -hmm. We certainly hadn't seen anything on that scale. We hadn't seen the political will behind that. And so yeah, this started, the idea came up in 2004 in December of 2005, the city and the county commissions approved the 10-year plan. They adopted that as the Gainesville Alachua County 10-year plan to end homelessness. And that gave us basically a roadmap on the direction we were going to head to start providing homeless services in a way that was both compassionate, but also more efficient and, and also cost effective. You know, I remember you mentioned the task force in 2004 and certainly one of the uh, key components of the 10-year plan to end homelessness was to locate a site for a facility. Uh, and, you know, there are always challenges. There's always concern from neighbors and uh, folks in an area when a facility like this is going to be located in close proximity to where they live or work. Uh, so there were some sites picked out that kind of fell apart. Uh, and then the city of Gainesville then located the property up on 53rd. Uh, and can you kind of walk us through what happened that the kind of fueled the transition from that 53rd Street property to the 39th Avenue property? You know, I think initially what we discussed for timelines for the site selection process was about a six month period. And, you know, we just opened Grace Marketplace in May of 2014 after really setting in motion the desire to do this in 2005. And we had looked at a piece of property on North Main, and we have looked at a piece of property on Northwest 53rd Avenue. Both of those had, had some value. I think some of those, both of those sites were, their primary selling point was they were available when we were looking. You know, had we ever thought back then that we would have access to a 25 acre campus to provide all kinds of human services, I, I don't think we could have even considered the possibility. It didn't seem like it would, was something that could have come into reality, so. So then we flash forward a little bit. The 39th Avenue property, which used to be the Gainesville Correctional Institute, uh, <coughs> it was decided that it was going to be surplused by the state of Florida. City of Gainesville uh, really did a great job in working back and forth, and there was a lot, there's not enough time to go into mm -hmm. uh, how challenging it was and the, and the great work that they did uh, with help from, you know, and support from the county and from the legislative delegation and folks in Tallahassee. So now we have this campus. Can you tell us a little bit about the campus itself, how many buildings there are? And sure, well, you know, to back up just a bit, I'm still not entirely sure how the city and the county managed to pull it off. Uh, I'm certainly not in any way aware of what it was that Assistant City Manager Fred Murray made happen, but I'm so grateful that it, it is moving forward. What we have now is, is, as you said, the site of the former Gainesville Correctional Institute. It is uh, in, within the fence. It's 25,000, or I'm sorry, 25 acre campus. There are 15 or so buildings out there about 80,000 square feet of space. And what it has allowed us to do is, is to really begin to develop our one-stop model. And, and the one-stop model for homeless services is really 
we are taking this approach the same reason uh, stores use a Walmart or a Lowe's approach rather than having to go to a doorbell store and a paint store and a lock store and a tool store, I can go to Lowe's and find most of what I need within you know, a very short time and space. So, uh, you know, I understand the concept of one-stop center, but uh, for folks who maybe have not been so involved in this issue, what, what is the vision, John? I mean, let's, let's step back a little bit and say, forget about funding. Uh, forget about the financial side of it. What is, what is the vision for what this place could be and what it will offer the, the folks that come for the services? The vision for Grace Marketplace is that it is the one location where people in our community who need help either maintaining their homes so that they don't become homeless to begin with or in finding a home and, and moving off of the streets and back into housing, that they have one place where they know that they can go so that whatever the needs are, whether it's help with job placement, help with education so that they can find a better or another job, help with childcare, help with medical issues, anything like that, they only have to know about one place. Right now, they've got to kind of juggle a vast network of, of dozens of social service agencies, all of whom offer slightly different services and on slightly different days, slightly different hours. And we want to be that location where if you're in trouble, you can come here and we will walk you through the campus. We'll help you get what you need, whether it's access to running water and bathrooms and a shower, whether it is developing a resume, whether it's uh, updating your job skills or, or just a place to stay for the night with, you know, access to some hope the next morning when you can start doing what you're going to do. So there will be sheltering. Absolutely. And uh, do you have agencies that have already signed on to actually have a physical presence at, at the Grace Marketplace? We do. They've been one of the most important parts of, of what we have been able to do so far. Uh, currently, if you were to come out to Grace Marketplace today, you could you would come into the Welcome Center. If you needed a place to stay, we've got an outdoor shelter pavilion. We have got probably 40 or so people staying out there on any given night. A lot of folks who were previously staying on the street or in the downtown plaza, uh, many of them have moved up to Grace Marketplace. Uh, once you came inside and spoke with somebody on the staff there, discussed with them a little bit about what you need, they could walk you down to representatives from Meridian Behavioral Healthcare who provide substance abuse and mental health services. Uh, there's a number of supportive service for veteran families services out there from again Meridian from Volunteers of America and from Family Endeavors there are people there who can help you sign up for food stamps or for Medicaid there are people who can walk you through the process of getting benefits from the Veterans Administration uh, there there basically are people there who can help you navigate what is often a really frustrating system and we can no longer do we have to say here's what we we've identified what you need and it's over here, it's across town, it's over here. We can say, let me walk you down to that office and, and we'll get you set up with what you need. John, this show is being taped on July 11th, 2014. So as of right now, you, you have the outdoor covered pavilion where folks can sleep, but you're still ramping up to the 24 seven dormitory uh, uh, shelter feature of this. Just wanna make sure people under, understood that clearly. That is certainly the plan in the future, uh, but that's uh, it's coming in stages, and uh, that, that stage is not available yet. Um, but you also, uh, I took a tour of the, of the building last week. Uh, thank you, I was amazed by, by what you've done so far. So you've got services, you've got some sheltering, uh, I noticed, and I, I don't think this is officially sanctioned by you, but there's also nearby wooded areas where, where uh, some tents are going up, and uh, I, th I think people are starting to gravitate towards the center. Uh, one thing you said, though, that I didn't realize was this facility is not just for homeless. Uh, you, you get people to take advantage of the services, including the food and the social services, who are, are housed but but they're still having trouble sure and and a lot of the services that will grow into providing especially 
would fall under the banner of homelessness prevention services. And, and the vision for the entire campus is that it will provide services for anyone in need. And a lot of times, people who are accessing homeless services are people who are at risk of homelessness. You know, and, and in those cases, whatever assistance we can provide that lessens the impact on their budget, whether it's meals, whether it's rental utility assistance, things like that, those function to keep people in their housing. And it's certainly much cheaper for us to keep people in their housing to keep their lives from being disrupted than it is to wait for them to become homeless and then work to help them rebuild everything that they've lost. If we can keep them from losing all of that to begin with, we're much better off to start. John, could you give, can you give our viewers any kind of an inventory of where, what you have renovated and just kind of the physical layout, what, what buildings are open and what functions they have? Sure. We, when the city first gained access to the site, the entire 25 acres was surrounded by a 12 foot tall razor wire fence. There was a sally port covered in razor wire. There were. Just a real warm, welcoming. Absolutely uh, not. It was the, <laughs> perhaps the least inviting place. It was not a place designed, nobody went there by choice. Right. No, nobody made the conscious decision to show up at this location, at this address. And so we had a lot to do. You know, for whatever other project goals or project objectives we have established for this campus and for this project, I think the true metric by which we're being evaluated is is our impact on the presence of homelessness downtown. And I think that for us to function successfully like that, it needs to be a place that's inviting. It needs to be a, a welcoming place and a place where people can easily navigate finding help that they need, whether that is just a place to go, uh, whether that is just access to the bathroom, meals, or services. It, it needs to be a place that people want to go. And so, since we started, we have basically, you know, you start by taking down all of the, the prison signs, the signs that say we never walk alone, and, and grinding out all of the signs that say no inmates past this point. <coughs> uh, put a fresh coat of paint on everything. And then you start really trying to make it a little bit more homey. We make it a place where we would want to be, which is fortunate because we're there probably 16 how hours many, a day. How many buildings total on the campus? We are using seven buildings at this time. And I think... I'm not sure I visited all seven buildings. I know I was in your administrative kind of area where some of the services are there's provided. Welcome Center. Welcome well. Center was really nice. Um, uh, good Just work. off of there, there's a, a kitchen and a dining area. Our kitchen is currently empty of any kind of kitchen equipment. It's something we're working on with neighborhood groups, but it's an, it's an empty shell right now. Yeah, but you, you can tell work has been done getting that shell ready for, uh, for when the equipment does arrive. Absolutely. And speaking of equipment, uh, and I, we're going to get into funding in just a section, but uh, I know that the local delegation in the city of Gainesville with, with an assist from Alachua County was successful in getting, I believe it was a $300,000 $300, and, and that is going to be used for renovating the remainder of the roofs to kind of just protect the other buildings until we can get those up and running with, with program services. And then whatever is left after that will go toward helping us purchase kitchen equipment. Real nice place for gatherings and worship and other things too. That uh, what do you call that building? We've got a the chapel or the uh, it was the chapel. We call it the chapel. It's it's a building available for any groups in the community that want to do any kind of spiritual services. We've got a number of services on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, there's a sundown Shabbat service. There are. Uh, other groups from the community that have been interested in doing meditation. There are Narcotics Anonymous meetings in there. It is basically uh, just a, a multi-purpose room that, that is gorgeous. You know, it's one of the, the centerpieces of the campus. Yeah. And so we've got that as well as a laundry room. We've got uh, kind of a multi-purpose room that we're hoping to partner with some local agencies for a job training program. Uh, we've got more potential than we do furniture or uses <laughs> of the buildings right now, but there's, there's so much of it there. Well, I visited the center back when the razor wire and the fences were still up. I think it was City Commissioner Randy Wells did an open house there early on. And it is uh, very welcoming now. And uh, the work that you all have done so far has been phenomenal. <coughs> a lot of people that I recognized from downtown were, were out there. Um, so I, I can tell that there's a shift happening and from word on the street that I hear is that folks are starting to trust 
that that's a place that uh, they will feel welcome at. We, we've talked about the goal and the vision, and, and those things are important, but uh, let, let's dig into the financial realities a little bit. Where does, your, where does what funding that you have in place come from right now? We currently have a contract with the City of Gainesville and Alachua County totaling $308,000 a year to provide services at the facility and more importantly to coordinate services at the facility. Mm -hmm. We've got a few small grants from the Department of Children and Families. We have some notices of awards. We have received additional or been awarded additional funds from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We will not receive those funds until probably January of 2015. Mm -hmm. And we continue to seek out any kind of state or federal funding that we can. But all of that accounted for, we still are looking at probably about a $200,000 a year shortfall based on just that $308,000 budget. All of those other funds have other services attached to them. So for us to provide the level of services we are providing right now, it's going to cost between five and $600,000 a year. And I, I know in, in speaking to you that you've got you know, all kinds of ideas going on uh, in your minds right now about how to raise those funds. You've got some current fundraising efforts that are, that are in play, right? We do. We have just started a land donation program where we basically we can leverage our ability to provide a tax deduction and we will clean up the land, put it back onto the market and or, or use it for program services, but basically where we can accept donations of land. We have got people who were guests at Grace Marketplace. We don't use the term clients or, or you know, cases or, or anything like that. We just call the people who are their guests, but two people who are sleeping on the pavilion or out as we speak, uh, clearing the land, making a, a good wage to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a motor donor program that is in place. We have received our first few vehicle donations. We had a motorcycle offer to it this afternoon. We have a boat and a riding lawnmower. So we're, we're filling out the types of vehicles that we have, but we're certainly uh -huh. able to uh, accept donations of any kind of vehicles. And those are going to be really helpful, but they, they take a little bit of time. It, I've, I've been amazed at how much it costs to raise funds sometimes. That's for sure. So for these programs to get up to speed, it's, it's going to take a year or so. You know, we're starting to see some benefits from them, but they, they will not solve the problems that we're going to face well before that. Now, I, I heard some talk, too, about possibly uh, getting a building that's up closer to 39th Avenue um, and doing some sort of, are you thinking of a thrift shop or a, a some sort of r retail operation? We do intend to either operate or to lease the building as a thrift store. That is something that will happen in the near future. We've got a lot of other moving parts right now that we're just trying to, to tighten down a little bit before we, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, but that is certainly on the table, yes sir. What, what does it take in terms of staffing to run a 24-7 secure uh, facility like this? A lot more than we ever anticipated. Yeah. You know, part of the issue is just the sheer size of the campus. That's one of the, the great things about Grace Marketplace is how much room we have to grow, how open it is, how, how beautiful it is, really. You know, you take down the razor wire and it turns out it's actually a pretty beautiful place. The issue is, with 25 acres, even if we have two paid staff at any given time, that's, that's still 12 and a half acres a piece that they are kind of responsible for overseeing. And we're not in the position that some smaller agencies are where the person who's standing in this location can see into the kitchen or can go out to the front door. You know, if we have to go from one place to the laundry room, that, that's a hundred yard walk. You know, so there, there are some issues that we hadn't really thought about logistically and, and are really just now starting to get a handle on. I've had a lot of conversations with folks in the community about Grace Marketplace and I get a lot of questions about what's going on there. So I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk to you so I can uh, respond to those questions a little bit better. I think there are a lot of people, though, that are really interested in the project. I think it's getting a lot of buzz right now. And I know you're considering a uh, Indiegogo campaign. That's a, a fundraising uh, website that allows people to make donations, $5 or $5,000. and. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be a really nice opportunity for a community-wide expression of support. Um, 
and it's, uh, it's kind of one of those no strings attached funding sources that can be really valuable to an organization. I know you were mentioning a lot of your funding. Sometimes you have to be careful about saying yes to some funding because there's another hoop that you have to jump through. Uh, so you're going to get that campaign up and we, running? We soon? are. The, the Indiegogo yeah. campaign I think is going to be critical because for as much as I would like to think that Grace Marketplace can, can function perfectly with one million dollar donor or, or one five million dollar donor, the reality of it is people will give what they're able to give. Um, I think this is a project that a lot of people support. I know this is a project that a lot of people support. They have supported it with their time, with their expertise. Uh, the, the sheer number of volunteers we've had come out for our volunteer days has, has been, quite honestly, a bit overwhelming. Some days when, when you're running and you're, you're ending up giving the most minute tasks at risk of having any volunteer leave the place with the idea that we don't need any more help because we certainly are, we have more there than we could co accomplish with the entire town in the next few years. You, you need a volunteer to be the volunteer coordinator. You need a volunteer, <laughs> volunteer coordinator. <laughs> you know, we do need help with fundraising. A lot of these things, they're, they're full-time jobs or they're, or they're at least very active part-time jobs that you know, my, my current title is Director of Operations, but I'm also Chief Groundskeeper, you know, Maintenance, uh, Facility Operations, IT, which is not even a, a forte. You know, there, there are all kinds of different things that uh, part of the, the nature of nonprofits is everybody has about six jobs, and, and we're trying to make sure that what we do, we do well, instead of doing everything kind of half well. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to Teresa Lowe, who's your, your uh, partner out there. Her official title is? She's the executive director. She's the executive the director, she, yeah. And uh, she's, she's been involved in this a long time and has done a phenomenal job. Yeah, she's brought a lot to the table in terms yeah. of her past experience. And, and she has been through a lot of the, the site selection. You know, Teresa is a go-to person on the campus. And she is, has as many job titles as I have and then four more. And she's probably either sewing the curtains or helping with a <laughs> meal or counseling somebody or writing a grant as we speak. Well, John, you're both passionate and dedicated and I appreciate the work you're doing and thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. write letters to each other a lot. A lot of the notes, they were just really dark. Expressions of anger when he was mad, he hit things. He said something to me about uh, killing himself. You have to take it seriously. The risk is too great. You have to um, try and help them get help. Tell somebody, tell an adult, counselor, parent, whatever. What are you going to do? Let them destroy themselves? I, mean, I don't see much of a choice at all. At SocialSecurity.gov, you can apply for retirement, disability, or Medicare from your own home. Chekhov applied in his pajamas.